Pochettino. Almost. Yeah, tell me, tell me how you want me to start this thing off. Or and listen, I can go on forever. It doesn't have to be a Q and A sort of thing, but I can just talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. And I don't know, but do whatever you want with me, man. Sure. Well, give me your just your initial thoughts, like when you first saw the news, what was going through your mind. I know you stated before that anybody without ties to MLS, you'd be happy. So, are you happy? And what are you thinking? Yeah. I recorded with Catherine Fuller a few months back when the rumors, I think the rumors of Jurgen Klopp had come out or maybe not. Maybe those rumors came out the day after, but that was the the high profile guy. And in the discussion with Kef, I had mentioned Pochettino as well as somebody that should be looked into. And so when the rumors came out this time around, And I had little birdies in my ear also telling me that this was a possibility. But, I mean, you know I'm involved on the pro side of things. And until ink is on paper, it doesn't matter as far as I'm concerned. I've been involved in, I mean, our group has been involved in hundreds, if not thousands of deals. And until ink is on paper, it doesn't matter. So when I hear things, either through my sources or through, X or wherever that, oh, Pochettino this, Pochettino that. I'm like, mm, okay, maybe. Yeah, maybe there's something to this, but it's not a done deal yet. And it's, and it's as of today, right now it's Friday, August 16th, 9 30 p.m. Pacific. There is no ink to paper. But to answer well, let, your let question, you probably right there, because I think that's yeah. so fascinating. And it's something that you mentioned too, right? Like the whole, what, what they try and do, right, is name somebody that they might bring in, right? before it was like, oh, maybe it's going to be Klopper. So now you're saying, oh, it's Pochettino. Do you think that this is a possibility that they're just saying it's going to be Pochettino to like quiet the fan base and then maybe something falls through in, in the paperwork or, you know what I mean? Is that this what is, it could be? This is, this is a little bit more realistic because of the sources that I have that told me stuff before this even hit mainstream. So I tend to believe this a lot more. I think I know what you're referencing. Yeah, because I made a post on X maybe a week and a half ago or so where supposedly they were pursuing this other guy, Materazzo, and that fell through. And I'm like, guys, there was, unless there was a legitimate offer on the table, like, hey, Klopp, hey, Materazzo, are you interested? Here's what we're offering. You know, it's 5 million a year, 10 million a year, 2 million a year for two years. And here are the, the, oh, the high level terms, unless U.S. soccer actually does that, there actually is no offer. And so many in the fan base, the way I view it, it seem to believe there's an offer when actually it was maybe just a text message or a brief little phone call to maybe the the coach's agents and not even the coach themselves, you know, so they didn't even advance to the point where there's a zoom call or in-person meeting, you know, with the manager and trying to figure out, Hey, are you, you know, let's work something out. That's a real deal. Not a text message. Hey man, I know you manage Jurgen Klopp. Uh, is he interested maybe in this? That, that's not a fucking offer. Okay. Right. So all that to say that I think the Bochettino thing is, a lot more legi- legitimate at that point. And not to mention the connection with Crocker at Southampton. And there's a whole bunch of variables. So yeah, there's that. Interesting. So I, I kind of want to go through your latest posts on Twitter, right? And also some of the comments. But so the first thing, and this is, I've been seeing it so much, is that so many of the fans and the media are saying what coach or what high level manager would want the USMNT job? Well, that was the predominating narrative forever. That was the predominant narrative before Burr got rehired again. This is the narrative that was placed out there by MLS media. Oh, nobody really wants this job. It, you can't get a high profile manager because there's no money for it. You know, no, no manager is going to accept a low salary here. All of it is bullshit, Benny. All of it is bullshit. They wanted to rehire Burhalter or just hire an MLS lackey. People say no high, pro- the media says no high pro- profile manager would want the job. And then the people who consume that media just repeat it because they, they believe the media. It's absolute nonsense. This is an amazing opportunity, which any top tier manager 
who is available and interested in international football at all would absolutely consider and would want. Like, what is better than, hey, you don't have to go through an entire cycle, four years until you get to World Cup. You don't have to qualify for a World, World Cup. You are literally going to be in a World Cup already. And that World Cup is at home, at home, Benny, okay? So you have a massive advantage there and you have no pressure whatsoever with respect to qualification or competitive games leading up to that major event. So there's no scrutiny involved, really. And it's the United States. The United States has one of the most docile, neutered, castrated fan bases in the world where you can suck ass like Burhalter and still survive in your job for six years, okay? And then compared to Chelsea, Tottenham, Paris Saint-Germain, right, of, of all places, that's pressure. Coaching the U.S. men's national team is not pressure in any respect to all those other locations. In club football, you are scrutinized on a daily basis. There's weekly games. Sometimes it's more than one week, one game per week if you're competing in European competition. Sometimes it's a grueling process. You're on 24-7-365. International soccer, you're not on 24-365, and you're not in under the microscope of the media. And in the United States, even less so. It's a joke over here. So it's vacation time galore with respect to the previous jobs of these international club, world-class club coaches. So who wouldn't want that? With respect to money, look, a lot of these managers are multimillionaires, okay? They have tens of millions of dollars at this point. I don't, so I don't necessarily know what the psychology is of somebody who's worth 20, 30, 40 million dollars. But I suspect if it is a short two-year stint with all these positives I just laid out, and they're not going to pay you a huge salary like Chelsea Football Club or PSG, it's probably okay. It's, you, you consider other things. Even, even folks like us, Ben, who are in that strata, you don't always look at how much am I going to make. You look at opportunity. You look at experience. You look at all these sorts of things. So I think that is the psychology that's going on. But irrespective of all that, I think they are going to pay him very, very well. And, and frankly speaking, I think what's more important to folks like that, and I'm actually, I'm actually going to include myself in this because I know what's important to me. Self-determination and power is more important than the magnitude of the paycheck. If you want to be able to do your art the way you want to do your art, you don't want to have somebody else or some other organization imposing on you what you can and cannot do. And so far more important than the, the salary requirements are the control and power terms. So I don't know. I don't know what sort of deal Pochettino has agreed to uh, or, or yeah, I, I don't know that. But that, I think that is the most important thing to consider here. Well, how much power do you think that he'll have coming in? Right? Do you think they're going to just hand him the keys and say, you know, take over or, or they're going to say, Hey, you need to select these certain guys. You need to play this way. I can't imagine that they're going to tell him how he needs to coach. Them. No, it's not, it's not like that. So let's, let's set the record straight. Nobody here in, in U S soccer anywhere, nobody's contractually telling you, you must select these guys or play those guys or those sorts of things. They are all implicit in nature many times. And you are kind of constantly under threat of Oh, I kind of need to do what the sporting director tells me to do or the general manager, or the CEO, you know, tells me to do, even though it's not in my contract, because if I don't do what they tell me to do, then there are consequences. But with somebody like Pochettino and here in the, uh, coming to be the U.S. men's national team coach, I don't necessarily think that is an issue because of his pedigree and his history. His success or quote unquote failure here with the U.S. men's national team is not going to ruin his career or dictate, you know, what his next job is or isn't going to be. And so I'm not too worried about that. The only thing that it could be concerning are terms in the contract that say, hey, you can't speak 
ill about the domestic league, you know, or you can't do these. Otherwise, there are consequences. What I don't know, I don't know what those consequences are, massive fines or who knows what. And then that kind of corrals you a bit because then when you're in press conferences, even though you want to say something like, oh, well, Josh Sargent left the English championship to come play at FC Cincinnati. Like I can't have somebody who's not really competing at a high level at the national team. You think twice about saying that truth, you know what I mean? And then all of a sudden the public doesn't get the truth that you're not selecting a specific player because well, fucking plays in MLS. And that's what got Jurgen Klinsmann in trouble because in Jurgen Klinsmann's ten, uh, tenure, he had Michael Bradley, he had Josie Altador, he had Clint Dempsey, all in a very brief window of time, kind of leave European football to come play major league soccer. And this was the kind of like leading up to a world cup. And, and imagine you're the manager of the team. You want your guys at the top of the top of the top form and you're coming to play recreational soccer. Imagine Benny, like you're in a youth soccer. Imagine if you have your stars saying, ah, nah, I'm going to go and play fucking AYSO or something, but then they're going to still compete with you uh, on the weekend. But they're not going to do your training. They're not going to do your sort of things, but that's who you have in your roster. It's a fucking disaster. And so that started getting Jurgen Klinsmann in massive amounts of trouble. That's my fear. I feel like that's part of also the reason why they were hesitant or, or they didn't hire Bielsa, right? Because he wasn't afraid to speak those truths or like if he's in a press con conference, he's not going to be scared to say, fuck Josh Sargent and this was not playing at the level I want him, then, you know, do you, do you think that's also part of the well, reason? I mean, uh, from the BS side of things, I've shared this story many, many times. I have it on extremely good authority, not just from one source, from multiple sources, like direct stuff, Ben, that Bielsa just rejected the offer basically because he couldn't do what he wanted to do. U.S. Soccer said, no, you can't do X, Y, and Z, which is what Bielsa demands. Interesting. So another thing that you mentioned right in your tweet that a lot of the, the critics are saying, like, there, there, any coach that's going to come in, he needs to have a good understanding of our domestic system and our domestic players. Do you think that's a requirement for the national team coach? Or This is a long standing narrative that exists in American soccer from the days of, I mean, after Bora, Bora Montinovich, yeah, from the days of Bruce Arena. Bob Bradley, all the domestic guys. And it's a cling to power, right? Oh no, we have to have one of our own be in a position of power because it's important to know the American player or the American system. What the fuck are you talking about? Okay. You have foreigners coaching all over the world and every club and every national team scouring the globe to find out who is the best football mind to bring aboard? There's nothing special about the American player. What are we talking about? It's the stupidest thing ever. And, and I haven't read the article, but Tim Howard today apparently published an article. And I've, read, I've only read headlines, so I have to be careful here. But basically saying that. I think too, Gary, a lot of the players are going to be in for a big wake-up call. Because I feel like under Greg, right? They were kind of under like cruise control, meaning like if they've been selected the past two, three years, they're kind of now going through the motions, feel like their place is secure no matter what, no matter where they're playing. And I think it'll be completely different with Pochettino, right? He'll, he's going to come in and set them straight. Well, hopefully, Benny, be, look, Pochettino, here's the pros and, there's pros and cons. Pochettino has just a two-year runway versus a full four-year runway or something of that nature where he can just tear the whole fucking system down. And maybe he'll choose to do that anyway, but it's much harder when you have such a short runway and not many competitive games, if any competitive games, leading up to the World Cup. So you're kind of fucking stuck with the player pool that was brought along to this point. But you bring up an important notion to the table here is the entitlement of so many of these players who have been anointed their place on the senior men's national team. And because they've been anointed many years ago, their club situations are as good as they are currently, which helps them continue being in the senior men's national team. 
So it's this virtuous cycle for them and the establishment, but it's a vicious, a bad cycle for soccer in general because nobody can break into the team necessarily. Nobody can break out of the team, if that makes sense. There was a recent interview or commentary today by Anthony Robinson, you know, the outside back that plays for Fulham. And they asked him about the Pochettino news. And he's like, oh, yeah, good manager. You know, uh, hope all goes extremely well. You know, that he kind of tell, gets along well with us and we get along well with him, you know. And he's basically communicating that the team is the team already. Like he's already he's already saying, oh, I'm I'm on this team no matter what, you know, and hopefully I, he gets along with me and I get along with him. Like, what the fuck? Like he's a lock already. Right? Yeah. What kind of fucking entitlement fucking attitude is this? You know, fuck you. And so I don't know how this is. I mean, this is why Pochettino is Pochettino. Hopefully he comes in and doesn't allow that sort of mentality to exist. Like you are replaceable. Fuck off sort of thing. I, I feel like I've heard this so much since he's first been announced, right? It's like, oh, Pochettino hasn't won any major titles, right? People want to use one game as like a reference as to whether or not a coach is great. And so obviously, right, we've, we've mentioned his first real competition with the U.S. is going to be the World Cup. So can you foresee like, okay, let's say the U.S. gets knocked out in the first round or even in round of 16, right? everybody's going to fucking crucify him already or is it going to be different now that it's Pochettino? What do you think? Shit happens, man. Shit happens in football. Anything can happen. You know, Brazil got fucking shellacked, whatever, what, 7-0 or 7-1, I already forgot. Right. In Brazil against Germany, they were the hosts of the World Cup. They lost. They got seven goals fucking dropped on their face by Germany. So anything can happen in football. It doesn't mean that Brazil suck. It doesn't mean that managers suck. Should happen. Colombia was the World Cup favorite for 1994. They had just come off of qualifying in Coma Bowl, crushing everybody, destroying Argentina 5-0 in qualification. And they got eliminated in the group stage. And, and they lost to the United States 1-0. Anything can happen, Ben, in football. So Pochettino might crash out of the group stage with the U.S., Honestly, I wouldn't exactly be surprised because I think we're extremely, the American public extremely overrates the team. At the same time, if I'm not mistaken, I think this is an expanded World Cup. There's more teams coming in. So, so, the, so the group stage is going to be a lot easier than it has been traditionally in the past. So there's a lower probability of something catastrophic happening. And since you're at home, it's possible for the team to go all the way to the semifinals, even though you aren't that caliber of a, of players or team at all. South Korea got to the, uh, was it South Korea? I think they got to the semifinals when the World Cup was over there. I'd have to look that up again. But traditionally, the home teams get very far. Even in Russia, Russia did extremely well when it was in Russia. And, and who the fuck is Russia in, in soccer? The pitfall here is always the media and the power brokers and what interest they're looking out for. So we have a foreign coach. If he crashes out of the group stage or gets eliminated, you know, right after the group stage early, they will craft narratives and they're already going to start doing this from now for two years leading to the World Cup. They're going to start prepping everybody. They're going to craft narratives such that they can always get an MLS lackey from here on out. Oh, no more foreign coaches. Look at this. You're in Klinsman. He was a disaster, even though he wasn't, Benny. And he was a disaster. Now you got Pochettino in here. Fucking disaster. No more foreign coaches. We're hiring all our guys that we control into the position. So that is the danger. Now, if Pochettino gets, goes far, then the narrative of we need a foreign coach gets stronger, and that's a good thing. The, the key thing to consider, Ben, the most important thing, is that Pochettino feels that he has enough power to speak the truth. That's what matters. That's the only thing that matters. So really, it's a it's a win win for U.S. Soccer, right? Because if if he fails out miserably, right, they can say, "I we told you guys we can't have a fucking international coach. We need one of our guys, right?" And if it's the other side where he's super successful, they look like geniuses, right? So really, for them, it's a win win. They can't 
they can't do wrong here. No, hundred percent, man, hundred percent. That is how they and most everybody operates. To be fair, everybody wants to be placed in a win-win situation. Hundred percent. Any prediction? I know it's early, Gary, but any early predictions on how the U.S. Fund? We'll do mm, at the World Cup or all the way leading up to it. I think I, I kind of predicted a lot of the things already. I like to compartmentalize it because soccer is not just the game. There's the on the field sporting slash entertainment slash competition slash all those sorts of things. And then there's all the off the field things. So it's 50 50. OK, if you want to talk s- exclusively about sport and entertainment, I think Pochettino will be much better than Berhalter in the sense that there will be a team and a performance that is something you can get behind because you'll see a lot of sacrifice, will, attack-minded play, um, non-entitled sort of postures, all the good stuff. You know, if you look at uh, Biesa's Uruguay, that's that's what I expect to kind of see from the team. Meaning like a high press? Fucking... Yeah, high press, high energy, nonstop, always looking to go forward and attack and destroy versus being cautious and pessimistic and those sorts of things. No matter who the opponent is. That, that's my expectation anyways, because remember, Pochettino is, is one of, quote unquote, Bie- uh, Biesa disciples. Yeah, yes, I coached him. He he comes from that sort of school. And so I, I expect to see good things, good things that I can say, yeah, this is great. I kind of support the U.S. men's national team again. And a meritocracy also. Like, Christian, you fucking suck. Get your fucking ass off the field sort of thing. At Tyler Adams, you suck. You're not even on the fucking roster. And like I, that, those are my expectations, my hope, which is something that an MLS guy would never, ever, ever fucking do. Off the field, which is way more important. My hope is that he'll speak his mind then. If the team does good, that it empowers him even more to speak his mind. And if, if the team does bad, I hope you'll have the courage to speak his mind and say, well, we, we fucking suck. End of story. No excuses. Yeah. And people here say, oh, you're throwing the players under the bus and all that stuff. No. Hey, we have to be realistic. We are not as good as Colombia. We're not as good as Uruguay. We are not as good as Brazil or Argentina or even Venezuela or fucking we're not as good as 10 other fucking European teams. We legitimately are like the 30th through 50th type of international team. That is the reality. So I'm hoping he's capable of saying something like that, which will be a positive for our culture, Ben. For sure. It's not an easy thing to do. But do you think that now with Pochettino, we're going to start to see more of the player profiles that, you know, 343 has been hyping up for the past 10, 15 years, meaning not the big, fast, strong players. And now we're looking at technical, smart soccer IQ players. Do you think he'll he'll look to bring in those types of players or do you think it's going to be more of the same type of player profiles that we've been seeing? It's too late. It's too late for the reason that I explained before. In the Burhalter era, he already he brought in this particular group. And because he brought in this particular group, this particular group was elevated on the international stage. And that helps their club's situation. And so since it helps their club situation, they're in better club situations than other players who were not elevated. And so those players get better over time because they're in better club situations. And so, and they keep getting called to the senior men's national team, which improves their club situation. And they call back to the senior men's national team and improves their club situation. And round and round they go to the point where there's only this group of players now that has been elevated to this international caliber of category. So how can you break into that? It's so hard because those who were not platformed on the senior men's national team have a much, much harder time in their clubs. And so as a consequence, how do you get on the senior men's national team? You feel me? Um, Like a never ending cycle. There's that coupled with he only has two years. So it's almost like the group is the group at this point. Who, Who can possibly break in? It's so challenging, Benny. 
if he had a full four year cycle and international managers aren't stupid, they know how this game works. If he had a full four year cycle, he would go and look out into the abyss and see, okay, where is the talent? Who do I like? What player profiles do I care about? Oh, I like this guy who is in USL championship, who's an 18 year old. By the time the World Cup comes around, he's 22, right? Or he's 19 or 20. By the time the World Cup comes around, he's 23, 24. I like this guy or this, you know what I mean? So I'm going to call him to the Seaman's national team because I know if I do that, first off, I get to see him. Do I really, really like this guy? Second, Secondly, he gets platform. Thirdly, because he gets platform, he gets elevated away from USL. All of a sudden, he gets purchased by fucking a Portuguese club, a Dutch club, or whoever from his USL team. And then two or three years later, he's ready. So you get to develop the pool that way. But he's inheriting the process of this garbage that has been occurring for six years. So to answer your question in short, I don't think there's much disruption to be made. So basically, if you weren't involved in the last two, three years with Greg's group and the whole team, you basically have almost no chance to fucking crack yeah, in. You're, your you're fucked, man. You are, you are so fucked. Can I lean on this a little bit longer? Because what I just outlined, the general public has no concept of. This is how it works. The whole concept of who are the best players is so flawed. People think that the cream naturally rises to the top. No, if, if you're good, don't worry, you'll get there. That's not how it works at all. You have to be platformed. You have to be selected. You have to be elevated. How many players have you come across in your young career, if I may say that? Because again, you're almost about to thir- turn 30. You've been a coach for quite a while, but you've seen a lot of great players around that could have gone far, but they got nowhere. Okay, so... The question naturally arises, why did they get nowhere? Sometimes, many times, perhaps even most times, it's because their mentality lets them down because they don't want it enough. But sometimes, or many times, or most times also, it's because nobody championed them and nobody got them somewhere. You feel me? Because if nobody got them somewhere, nobody really platformed them, then that fucks with their head too because they start thinking, I'm not going anywhere and they start giving up and giving up and giving up and let, next thing you know, they fizzle out and die. But they were way more talented and way more, had way higher ceilings than guys that did get some. I don't know if you've experienced that or seen it yourself, but I've seen it happens all the time. Guys who are way more talented get nowhere and guys who are way less talented, they actually climb the ladder very far. And you think it's it's 100% a mentality thing, right? They just don't have it in them to grind it not out. Of- not 100%. It's, it's, are you being platformed? Is somebody championing you and helping you be platformed? Is, is a gatekeeper saying, I pick you and elevate you? Yeah. But how do you, how do you get platformed, right? Do you have to, you have to know people? Do you have to fucking have connections? I mean, it's, it's, it's more it's, than just what's on the field, no? It, it's a number of things. First off, you have to obviously do your job and always be exceptional as a player. Then somebody has to see you, and then somebody has to believe in you. And then somebody also who has the network and the connections has to say, okay, I'm going to leverage what I have to elevate you. And this goes on throughout the whole entire youth pipeline up to and including the transition of pro and up to and including while you're a pro from age 20 to 30. This has to be happening all the time. Problem in in this country is that the system is monopolized, Benny. So you have a monopoly gatekeeping who gets platformed and who doesn't get platformed. And there's a a tremendous amount of non-sporting things that occur that intervene and decide who gets platformed and who doesn't get platformed. That happens not only at the player level, but at the coach level, at the technical staff level, at the non-technical staff level, at the, you name the job, it's a gatekeeper driven system. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question, but suffice it to say that this whole notion that the, the true cream rises to the top is one of the largest, biggest misguided things that exist in this country. 
Why do you say that, that it's a big myth, that, that the cream doesn't rise and stop? Well, what I just said, a gatekeeper has to choose you. Let me see if this makes even more sense. Let's say that you are in charge of an MLS franchise, whatever that means. I don't know who's in charge. Sometimes it's the coach who actually is in charge. Sometimes it's not the coach. Sometimes it's the GM. Sometimes it's the technical director. Sometimes it's the president. Sometimes it's a combination of those things. Whatever the case may be, they have an opinion of who are good players and who are not so good players. So based on their opinion, they elevate who they think. If it was somebody else in charge, an entirely different player would get picked or elevated to be a starter or to get a contract or to not get a contract or you name it, or to be sold or not to be sold, you name it. It's a gatekeeper driven system. It seems like so many things have to fall in place for you to be successful, right? No question. So the only thing a player really can control is how hard you work and not giving up. Because if you do that, at least the probability that somebody at some point in time, maybe will pick you, it will be increased. Well, do you think now... Because you're saying, right, you need somebody to elevate you. Now Pochettino's in this role. Let's say he likes, he sees this kid from USL, right? Do you, does he have the power to call the club in Europe and say, hey, fucking sign this kid or, you know what I mean? Or elevate him like that. Yeah, yeah, of course. Does he have that power? Yeah, of course, Ben. Of course. And you think he'll use that? Well, obviously, like in two years, like we said, it's not enough time, right? But for future. Uh, of course, Ben. The, the challenge is, there's just so many challenges, Ben. It's so many challenges. You have to think about the priorities. Let's talk hypothetically. In theory, in principle, yes, it's possible that his scouts, and this is another thing, he has to have his personal staff. You can't have U.S. soccer injecting, okay, you're going to be a senior men's national team coach, but we want to inject this one person or these two people into your technical staff. No, fuck you. I work with my team. You know, I'm not, I'm not having any of your team. But aside from that, I don't think with a two-year term, you're going to be scouring USL for talent, okay? It's just not going to happen. Or even, let's say, MLS, right? If he likes a guy in MLS, is he going to be telling the player, you need to get the fuck out of here and go play in Europe? Well, I don't think, no, I, I don't think that's how it would work. I think if he really liked somebody, he would just call them to the senior men's national team and ha play a friendly or two friendlies. And that in and of itself, coupled with Pochettino, maybe saying, Hey, this fucking kid's good. He gets on the phone to whoever, you know, Espanol in Spain or Leganes or Girona or Getafe or whatever. And says, hey, look, I have this kid. He's 20 years old. He's pretty good, man. I, I, I think you should take a closer look at him. Yeah, that happens all the time, Ben. What do you think are going to be his biggest challenges coming in? Because obviously he has a limited amount of time. He already, like we've said, he already has this player pool stuck in place. What do you think off the field his biggest challenges are going to be? I think the biggest challenge that he's going to have is to be able to communicate and implement his ideas of how to play with the guys and, and have it executed. I think that's the biggest challenge. What about like off the field stuff, though? meaning dealing with USSF? No, that's a joke, bro. Play. No, it's that's a joke, bro. He, you worked, you worked in the premier league. It's a fucking joke here, man. No challenges. You, you've got you've got Muppet media members who know fuck all about soccer asking you stupid fucking quest, softball questions. And, and with executives like US soccer or MLS talking like it's a joke, man. There are no there are no challenges. He has a lot of power coming in, no? Of well, of course. You have this mandate and you're high profile the highest profile manager that this country has ever had for the US men's national team. Don't fucking talk to me. It's interesting too, because coming from having coached PSG, Chelsea, like this, this is probably the least pressure he's ever felt in a row. Benny, like, it's a fucking joke, Benny. It's a joke. People and people here say, oh, you don't want to come into this shit show. High pressure. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? Well, I feel like going to a World Cup for a manager, you feel some type of pressure and responsibility on your shoulders. No? no, yeah, no question. And you want to win because you don't get to that level as a player like he did or that level as a coach as he has without having an inner fire that's without being self-motivated to be a winner. And interesting you bring that up because there were all these interviews of former Colombian national team players and coaches after they got eliminated by Argentina 
in the Copa America asking, oh, you know, what happened, what went wrong? And almost all of them have said, look, Argentinians, since they were babies, are fucking pressured to be winners and win. And second place is a tragedy, an tra absolute tragedy. So that you have this sort of trauma in your mind that you cannot lose. It's so traumatic to lose. And so they have that extra gear in their mentality that us Colombians and many others don't have. And so bringing it to Pochettino, I'm sure that obviously applies to him too. It's like, you cannot fucking lose. You know, you have to, when you have to do the best possible job, you can. And you don't think he's motivated to think to himself amongst so many things of, dude, if I take this team farther than it's ever been in the World Cup under these conditions, right, I'm a fucking genius. Like, lick my balls. Of course. Was that true from your own experience growing up? Gary? Of course, bro. Right. Of course. Of course. Nothing's ever good enough. Nothing's ever good enough. I com com you know, compliments and good job or it's okay that you came in last place. You know, those sorts of things don't really exist. And that's not to say that I, I think my parents did exceptionally well, exceptionally good job. Awesome. It's just a cultural thing then that you have to be the best. It's not necessarily a bad thing because I it's think not, a lot of people he, hear that, right? For example, you just said like, oh, like Argentinians, they're never going to say like, oh, great job or fantastic, right? So people might think like, oh, they're fucking too harsh or they're too critical. But I mean, at the end of the day, who won the last World Cup, right? Argentina. So, I mean, is it hard to grow up like, I mean, I, I personally don't know. I didn't grow up with Argentinian parents. I can assume it's not easy, right? Maybe you fucking come home from school and you, you had a bad day and you're looking for something from your parent and it's fucking nothing, you know? It's, hey, Gary, why didn't you get a fucking A on this math test? It's hard to judge, Ben, because I've only lived one life. I haven't lived your life or the hundreds of millions of other people's lives to be able to compare. It's all theoretical and hypothetical because everybody else has their own things that they have to live through. And all I can say is that culturally, this seems to be the case for Argentinian. And that includes me. I mean, I was born and raised here in the United States, but my parents are Argentinians through and through. And all my family, every extended family is all from Argentina. And this is just the reality. As nurturing as and as loving as it's always been, and I've never needed anything, Benny. I was given everything. You know, I, in my youth and growing up, I never lacked for something. But from the perspective of being pushed, you are pushed. You have to fucking do good. Like, don't come at me with excuses. You know, you're called out. But here in, especially in modern day America, oh, fucking eighth place. Here's your trophy. Oh, it's okay, Johnny. It's the coach's fault. It's not your fault that you don't get playing time. Oh, it's okay that. We lost against Panama in the Copa America. It was just a fluke, you know, blah, blah, blah. We breed losers here. None of this is going to fly with Pochettino. No. Ben, I don't, I, I'm waiting to see. I don't think that an Argentinian can tolerate the bullshit. I don't, I don't see it. I don't see it. I can see Pochettino clashing heads with Neymar or Mbappe or these guys when they push back maybe on what he wants or what he wants to do. But those people are pushing back on Pochettino because those people are also winners. So it's winner mentality against winner mentality and they try to work things out. But if it's a winner mentality and some fucking loser comes and tries to challenge you or, or complain or whine or wants things different, get right the fuck off. You think this is going to be beneficial for the recruitment of dual nationals. A lot of players have been on the fence or saying... Ben, it's, like, ben, it's too late. It's two, it's two years. That's the problem here. No, that, but I mean, even even long term, or like, okay, Pochettino just got announced, right? Let's say I'm a young kid. I can choose to sign right now between Mexico and U.S. Am I going to sway towards now the U.S. because Pochettino's there, or am I going to... You know what I mean? So this comes down to what is his contract? Is his contract only through the 2026 World Cup? Or is his contract beyond that? Or is there a clause there? It's like, oh, if you get to the quarterfinals or something, then 
you, Pochettino, have the option to extend your contract for another cycle. I have no idea. I have no visibility into that. But if that's the case, if somebody thinks that you're here for the long term, then it's a consideration. As of right now, my understanding is that it's only through the World Cup. No, I was going to ask you because I, I feel like you're always pretty spot on with your predictions. So, I mean, like, what do you think they'll offer him? Meaning how many years? No idea. And I, I don't even want to ask. You know, usually when I ask for favors or something, it's when it really matters. And I'm not going to ask for a favor regarding information when it's something like this. Yeah, crazy. No, but how funny would it be, G, if tomorrow they come out saying, hey, Pochettino, something fell through. We're now oh, hiring, it's possible. We're now hiring Brian Smelter from Seattle South. Oh, bro. Bro, <laughs> I've been around long enough, dude. I would not be shocked or surprised if, some, oh, no, Pochettino ha, you know, hasn't resolved his contractual obligations with Chelsea, so we can't hire. Not at all surprised if that were to happen. Well, honestly, for me, I'm kind of excited because I feel like my whole life, there's never been like a national team that I could get behind and it feels like the whole country is in on it and the, the, just the culture hasn't been there. But I feel like this hire is starting to wake people up a little bit and the culture is starting to improve. And so I think like going into the this next World Cup, it's going to be something fun to be a part of, right? Like you look at all the South American countries at the World Cup, they're there fucking chanting, like having an amazing time and you feel part of a culture, you feel part of a family here at the U.S., it has never felt like that for me. I mean, I want to be a USMNT fan. I just never been like, oh, fuck, this is amazing. I need to buy a ticket to Miami so I can go see them play. I need to fucking go hang out with the outlaws, right? Like, I've I've never felt that. But I feel like maybe this hire can bring change and maybe start getting people excited, you know? Good. I mean, how yeah. fun is it to fucking be there with your countrymen and fucking celebrating and chanting and dancing, right? Like, and I mean, sure, there's a small group. Uh, in the U.S. that do that, but it's not the whole country. I feel like, Gary, it's not going to happen. But we win the World Cup in 2026, and you've seen how it was in Argentina, right? How many people are out there in the streets? Three million, four million. Mm-hmm. Here, it's going to be like 50,000 or some small number, right? Nobody gives a fuck, you know? So hopefully, like, this hire can bring excitement and change and spark a little more culture in the fan base. Well, that that is very telling, what you just said, because... You were born and raised in this country. Your parents are from this country. You are American through and through, and you don't feel connected to the United States national team. And you work in soccer, and you've been in soccer your entire life, okay? I don't think that's anything to be ashamed of. I think that is a signal that there's something wrong here. And I think that point in and of itself is something that would be great if more people lingered on and thought about a lot more. We have a huge number of folks just like you, Ben, just like me, who have been in soccer their entire lives, who are American, born and raised here, and they don't care about the men's national team. Think about that, you know, and you're hardcore soccer. You're hardcore. I'm hardcore soccer through and through all my life as you are, and you work in the space and I work in the space and we could give two shits about our national team. Why? And we're not alone, Benny. We're not outlier cases. This is a huge proportion of the soccer loving households in the country. You have to ask yourself why, why? And I've been trying to help people see the answer to that question. And it's because it doesn't represent us. There's something wrong here. Clearly, when you say that you're now at least somewhat excited regarding Pochettino coming here, that's also a little bit of a signal. And the signal that you're communicating is, in my opinion, that at least one data point of excellence has been injected into the program that is supposed to represent you as an American. So they injected one tiny data point, the coach of excellence. And you're like, ooh, okay, now that piques my interest. So perhaps it's the country or the people in charge have never cared about excellence in the program. And you, without putting your finger on it, just... I don't know, organically or intuitively or emotionally just feel that they don't really care. So why the fuck should you care? That's a good point. And I think something to think about is everybody says, or everybody knows in America, right? America's the best. We have the best teachers, best doctors, best everything, right? 
And then when it comes to the U.S., like they've never cared about it and they've never strived for excellence. Sure, they've had some decent moments here and there, but they, it's never been it's never felt like they're pouring everything to it. It's always felt like a like a side project, never like a, a main thing. Because, yeah. Ben, and let me inter interject there, because here is the crux of it all. The folks in charge only care about preserving their power, consolidating their power, and remaining in charge above and beyond everything else. And that includes above and beyond the sporting side of the equation or sporting excellence. They do not care about that. Sure. They want it to be the best they can be, but only if it doesn't touch at all their capacity to preserve power. That's the problem. It's, it's all political here, Ben. All of it. Do you think we're the only national team that operates that way? Because it seems like even the countries that aren't having success, like even look at Mexico. They've been mm -hmm. fucking chalking the past three, four years, but still their, their fan base is, I would rather fucking go and be a Mexico fan and watch one of their games that at their fucking watch parties because there's a culture there and they actually care, right? Is it just us operating this way where, where the gatekeepers are concerned about holding their power? Or is there other countries too that are doing this too? No, well, here, look, ev everybody wants to preserve the power. Let's get that out of the way, okay? It's just how capable are you of preserving it? And here in the US, they've architected a system such that they only attract a fan base that is casual and doesn't really care that much to revolt. And so they don't attract me. They don't attract you. They don't attract the hardcore soccer demographic in the country, which is the vast majority of people. They don't attract us. They attract the NFL fan, the baseball fan, the hockey fan, the basketball fan, the casual fan, you know, the new fan who's never really been in soccer before, but now they kind of latched onto this thing. You're in Seattle. You're a hipster. You're like, oh, let's go see the Seattle Sounders. Oh, what's this soccer thing? Oh, okay, cool. That was kind of fun. You know, I've never, cool. I'm, I guess I'm a soccer fan now. That is who they attract. And so that demographic will not revolt against power because they have no concept of anything that we just discussed. And so because of that, they can get away with so many things. But outside of this country, that is not the case. So if you go to Argentina, Brazil, Uruguay, Venezuela, Mexico, Costa Rica, El Salvador, Croatia, Poland, you, Russia, you name it, the hardcore soccer fans are involved in their domestic game, okay? And they don't put up with bullshit because they understand they've been around. They've seen it all. They understand all these things. And they will revolt. What does that revolt look like? A combination of things. It can be boycotting. It could be the ultras fucking, you've seen the ultras at Milan or whatever, fucking calling out the players and the coach or confronting them. And the players feel so obligated, so obligated that they will go after the game and show their faces to the ultras and present themselves kind of like, oh, I, I'm listening to you. What do you want to say? You know, okay, thank you. You know what I mean? Here, that doesn't exist, Ben. So there's no pressure on the power centers in this country. But now, little by little, the, the fan base is becoming a little bit more and more educated. And this is why we have Pochettino now, if it, it actually ends up happening. Because the fans are just a little bit more educated. Just a little bit more educated. And look what was accomplished. No more Bruce Arenas. No more Bob Bradleys. None of this fucking Brian Schmetzer history teacher, high school history teacher from Seattle. None of that shit. Get us an international manager. So really what you're saying is that U.S. soccer doesn't really want us as fans, meaning the outspoken, passionate. No chance. They don't they, want us as fans. They fucking hate us. They want nothing to do with us. And by the way, and by the way, let's be very clear. U.S. soccer is controlled by Major League Soccer. It's not supposed to be that way. U.S. soccer is supposed to be in charge. The Federation is supposed to be in charge. They're supposed to be the regulator of the ecosystem. MLS is supposed to obey. U.S. soccer, the, the federation, but it's the other way around. U.S. soccer has been compromised and corrupted and major league soccer is the boss in town. Can you expand a little bit on how exactly like MLS is in charge? Because for myself or maybe other people that are listening that maybe I have a little understanding, but can you go into a little more detail about 
what is it that is making MLS have all this power over USSF? Yeah. This is this is a, a multi-book and 15-hour audiobook explanation. But here are the cliff notes. MLS has a monopoly on Division One, okay, on professional soccer. It's a monopoly. There are no clubs in Major League Soccer. They are all like McDonald's franchises of corporate McDonald's headquarters. So Major League Soccer basically has 30 teams that it owns and operates. And it's closed, no promotion relegation. And so if you want to work, and, and, that's, and because of that, they've expanded, right? So all of a sudden they have MLS uh, Next Pro, which is has been sanctioned third division pro in, in soccer. They have MLS Next, which is the highest tier like youth soccer league or academy system here. If you want to have a livelihood at a high level in American soccer, you have to obey the monopoly. If you do not obey the monopoly, cool. It's your freedom to, it's your right to, but good luck trying to operate at a high level in American soccer. It's very difficult, if not impossible because it is monopolized. And so when it comes to U.S. soccer, the same exact thing applies. Let's say you have a job in U.S. soccer, vice president, president, director of this or that, scout here or there, U.S. soccer youth national team coach or assistant coach, whatever position U.S. soccer that you have. If you do not obey major league soccer, two things. One, you might find yourself out of the job at U.S. soccer. Two, once you are unemployed by U.S. soccer, for whatever reason, and you want to get a job in American soccer, you're not going to get a job at a high level in American soccer. You might get a job in USL, maybe, because maybe the USL franchise or club or whoever headquarters might be like, oh, should we hire this guy or not? Because, I mean, we want to be good with MLS also because they monopolize the ecosystem. So I don't know. Do I want to be on MLS's bad side? And so where do you go for work then at that point? So all this calculus is done by Cindy Parlo and what's that guy, Batson guy, who's the CEO of U.S. Soccer or Greg Berhalter or all the assistants of Greg Berhalter, the U.S. youth national team coaches and technical staff. And like, oh. I just, man, I can't say anything bad about MLS at all. Otherwise, that's my livelihood. So that is how it's captured, Ben. So when U.S. soccer makes decisions at the board level, of which Don Garber has been on the board since forever, which is a ridiculous thing, a whole other subject, and there's an initiative on the table to vote, guess how everybody's going to vote? You're going to vote the way that Major League Soccer wants you to vote. If you don't, well, like you're running the risk of not working in American soccer at a high level. So it's basically you shut the fuck up or you don't have a job, right? Yeah, pretty much, man. Crazy. It, that's fucked. Gee. I mean, I'm just wondering how, how we even got to this point because I, I can only assume around the world it's not the same way. Like the Premier League is not fucking own the English national team or La Liga doesn't own the Spanish national team, right? So it's how did we get to this point? We allowed one single corporation to hold monopoly power on division one and we meaning a league. We allowed a league, which is one corporation to control the entire thing. Everywhere across the world, Ben, it's club versus club. The clubs are the entities, are the different businesses, and those different businesses compete against each other. So it's club versus club. Here, we have allowed it or made it actually to be league versus league instead of club versus club. And so with that one decision, now it's a league that controls the entire first division. So the first division is not comprised of 30 separate or 20 separate or 25 separate individual businesses competing against each other. No, it's one single business that owns a whole fucking thing. So once you do that, then you're screwed. Everywhere across the world, since it's not like that, you can talk massive shit about Real Madrid and still have a job at Espanol or Barcelona or Girona or Getafe or Leganes or Atletico Madrid or whatever. You still have a job. You can, it's okay. You're fine. But if you talk shit on one corporation that owns everything, 
then it's not fine. So meaning like uh, Greg Vanny of the Galaxy can't go and talk shit on FC Dallas after a game or the way that things are run. Otherwise, it's he's basically calling out the entire league, right? Because no, he can talk shit about FC Dallas. What he can't talk shit because FC Dallas is just a team. It, FC Dallas is nothing. FC Dallas is just one little McDonald's owned by corporate McDonald's. You can talk shit. Oh, I work in fucking Irvine McDonald's. I'm going to talk shit on Houston McDonald's. Mm -hmm. That's fine. But yeah. you can't talk shit about corporate McDonald's. That makes sense. Because then you're fucked. Then you, can't play, then you can't work in Irvine McDonald's or Dallas McDonald's or Houston McDonald's or Portland McDonald's. You're, you're out. Well, so we'll circle it back to Pochettino. Does, does he, as a national team coach, does he have the power to change any of this? Meaning MLS... Can he come and say, hey, you guys, what the fuck are you doing? This should be a promotion relegation league. Open the system. Does he have that power or no? Is that he has, he has the power to move our culture as a whole forward a little bit more than where we're at now. That's the power that that podium has. And that is why Jurgen Klinsmann got fired because Jurgen Klinsmann tried to move our culture just a little bit forward with truth about the things that I just discussed. And no, 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 naughty boy, you're out. Well, let's hope it's not the same scenario. No, well, it, it's hard. It, it's hard, Ben. It's harder now. Your cleansman is not Pochettino. It's not, it's not the same thing. It's harder for you to go through all this debacle, hire a top-tier coach like Pochettino, and then get rid of him <laughs> before the World Cup. Like just, just because maybe he says, oh, yeah, in the United States, you know, domestic league is not where it should be. Whatever the fuck he says, it's going to be very, it's so, you can't get rid of him, man, at that point. It's so hard. There's no way. That's, but, that's, but that's why it's crucial what his actual contractual obligations are. Because maybe in his contract, it says, you cannot speak ill about our domestic league or all kinds of little stipulations. Otherwise, you're fine. Half a million dollars here, 100K there for every infraction or something like that. So, I mean, we'll be able to tell if he has that power to, you know, not speak out and talk shit, but if he has the ability to say what's on his mind and critique things a little bit. Will we be able to tell? We'll only be able to tell when he actually does it. So that's what I'm saying, right? If if in his first three pressers, like we don't, we're not hearing anything, and it's you know, then it's like okay, we we know there's probably some stipulation. No, no, I it. don't think so. I th no, I don't think so because I don't think he has any reason to say anything that can be interpreted as negative towards our system so quickly. It's only when something bad happens, bad in quotes, that he'll have something to say. So, for example, I'll do something that everybody's familiar with. For example, let's just say that before the World Cup, Weston McKinney comes back to MLS. Josh Sargent comes back to MLS. You know, so many key guys maybe come back to MLS because they're being offered uh, huge contracts or something. Then he actually has something to say at that point. That will be the test. Does he say something? And this is what happened with Jurgen. So just to relate it to something that everybody's familiar with back in Jurgen's era, that is when you get to see whether he will say things or he won't say things. Or if for some reason he gets asked, oh, why isn't Diego Luna being called up? You know, or why aren't these MLS players being called up? You know, I'm sure he'll be very diplomatic about it. But at some point, if idiotic media continues to insist with stupid shit like that, he might come out and say the truth. You know, I might come out and say, like, the fuck you want me? You want me to call this fucking guy who plays rec soccer? You know, when I have a World Cup coming up, what, what are we, what's going on here? Crazy, Jake. All right, Jake. Any, any parting remarks? Let me, let me just say this because it's, it's so funny. I, I always love reading people's comments under your tweets. And a common thing that, that always comes up is, Oh, Gary, wh why are you so negative about everything? Mm -hmm. When it seems like they did what you want, you're still negative. <laughs> one, of the, one of the comments was, uh, it was, let's see. Oh, so you're just going to be angry no matter what. You know, you could choose to live life differently. <laughs> <laughs> well, look at how I'm laughing right now, dude. 
my life is good. I'm happy. I'm happy, man. I'm, I'm actually, I'm actually very, I was thinking about this just the other day. I, I'm actually quite fortunate and happy in a general sense, because I'm pretty free, Ben. I'm a pretty free man. You know, I don't have a traditional wage or salary job where I'm a slave, which is the most important thing in my opinion. And I can come out and express my opinion as I see fit, you know, especially in a domain that I know some, a little something about and I care about. And so I'm actually quite happy, you know. I, I think it's more of a reflection of folks who make comments like that. And I, and I understand it. Okay, there's some credence to that. And I'll address it in a moment. I'm actually more concerned for them. It's like, why are you hopping on social media? Like, <laughs> attacking somebody's fucking post you know like you have you have the problem yeah yeah they live for that i i always fucking laugh my favorite thing ever too is the fucking not gary clavin twitter <laughs> does that still exist i don't even know no it's i it, i think it does exist because actually today i was i meant to type in on twitter 343 but i was typing in gary clavin uh-huh. And fucking not Gary Clavin about that. Oh, for oh, for real? So it still exists? I don't exists? know if they've been tweeting or not, but okay. whoever's out there running that account, keep it going. <laughs> yeah, no, it's fine. It's totally fine. No, but to address that a little bit more directly, I just don't think they understand what I stand for or what I care about. What I actually care about is not fucking a soccer ball with 22 guys on the field and uh, rectangular their field and who wins, who doesn't, who got scored more than who else and what formations did play and who is the coach. I, I don't care about that many. What I really care about are the principles of freedom, opportunity, and merit. That's what I care about. I care about, I care about things that are far beyond soccer. And soccer is just a proxy. Soccer is just an ecosystem by which so many social, political, economic, and cultural things play out. And so while some people maybe choosing their battleground as left versus right, red versus blue, Kamala versus Trump, all that sort of stuff. That's their battleground for what they believe in as to how our civilization should be structured and how it can be better or how it will be worse. I don't choose that battleground. My battleground is those exact same principles, though, expressed through the proxy that is football. Because in football, you have all of the elements. You have the social element, you have the political element, you have the economics, and you have the culture. And people who operate within this space are exposed to all of those forces as well. If you are a player, you want to fulfill your potential. Okay, well, what is in the way of you fulfilling your potential? There's all of these non soccer specific things in play. If you are a coach, how do you fulfill your potential? Well, there's all these non-soccer specific things that are in play. If you're a club, if you're a business, if you're a whatever touch point you want to mention in this soccer ecosystem, all of those social, political, economic, and cultural factors are in play. That is what I care about. And I think the principles of freedom, opportunity, and merit are worth fighting for. So when folks say, oh, we just hired Pochettino. Gary, I thought you know, you'd be happy about this, you know. Okay. Maybe, maybe, but let's, let's get educated. How does that relate to the things that I just expressed? Because that's what matters. And they're coming at it from the angle of, oh, Gary, we just hired a top-tier manager with European experience, Champions League experience, you know. We're going to be a better soccer team. Like, why aren't you happy that we're going to be a better soccer team? I don't give a fuck about being a better soccer team. Well, you heard it. Gary Cleveland is, is a happy man. <laughs> <laughs> we, ben, we all need a mission, dude. If you don't have a mission, in my opinion, how can you be content? And people find missions in different arenas of their life. Here's a mission. I'm fighting for those principles, those human principles through this proxy. And that brings me fulfillment. It brings me, yeah, I have a mission, an objective. It gets you up in the morning, you could say, no? Or no? Nah, what gets me up in the morning is like, oh, fuck, I should stop being a bum. Let's get <laughs> up. All right, man. That's All right, good you. stuff.